Lights. Blink flashback. I can see it through my eyelids. <laughs> Okay, so I haven't done one of these videos in a very long time because of how difficult it had been to try to source together parts and components that were in stock and that you had a choice over. Uh, however, with the pricing coming down-ish, I don't want to say coming down, that's misleading into what the actual economy is doing right now, but with overall pricing coming down on components, uh, I wanted to see if, how close to a $1,000 build we could do. It seems to be the magical number right now. Um, and we'll see what those parts look like, where you could kind of also shave a little more off the, this build and move it around to, to change around your components. So I use Amazon US for this particular build. And again, this is just a parts list, which is something I haven't done in a long time. Let's talk about it and let's see what you can get for $1,000 in March of 2022. We interrupt this video to bring you a special message from iFixit. No, we interrupt this interruption with this interruption about new stuff from iFixit. We should even grab this card, but inventory sucks. Fix the inventory problems with iFixit. Whoa, don't drop it. Can't fix that with iFixit. Just kidding, yes you can. Wish you could take iFixit with you anywhere, but your pockets aren't big enough. Introducing the new Moray. And the new Mino. Take them with you anywhere. So get iFixit for your loved ones, or just get them for yourself. Okay, so first things first, you can spend $1,000 a thousand different ways, and you might find 10 content creators at a $1,000 price point, and they all are gonna recommend something different. So that's what makes these videos kind of nice to see, is you'll see different ways people would spend that budget. Some might sp allocate a little more towards the CPU. Some might allocate, obviously, as much as possible to the GPU with current pricing, um, but some might choose an M.2 drive, some might choose a SATA drive. There's a lot of different areas that you can play with in pricing. Now, I'm gonna try and stick as close to $1,000 as possible, but staying under 1,000 is gonna be very difficult, so I gave myself like a few percent leeway in either direction. Important to remember that by the time this video goes up, day-to-day -day pricing is changing. So you're gonna see this fluctuate, obviously. Um, if you're watching this in the future, could be a lot less, could be a lot more, who knows. First things first, let's go ahead and start with the CPU. In my opinion, the CPU is what you base a lot of your system around. If you go with a really low spec CPU, you obviously don't want to pair it with a really high end GPU. Now we're not going to be pairing it with a high end GPU obviously because we're at a thousand dollars price point. So that's never going to be, I mean, that's not even enough for a high end GPU. So we obviously know that that's not going to be an issue there. However, in terms of availability of 11th gen Intel and 12th gen Intel and the premium Intel still charges for their CPUs, it's still extremely difficult for me to recommend an Intel CPU when it comes to uh, this price point. That's why I stuck with, uh, once again, a Ryzen CPU. So this time, uh, 5600X. Yes, I could go a little bit lower. I could go like 5400G or something like that. But I'm really planning on sticking with a discrete graphics card because of the fact that the discrete graphic or the, the integrated GPUs that are built into Ryzen right now are still based off of old Vega technology. And if we were seeing RDNA implementation into APUs, that would probably change my mind. However, because it's still based off the old Vega architecture, it's still not great. So with this $1,000 price point and the GPU that I chose that you'll see later on, I feel like this is gonna be an overall better performer. The 5600X is a six core 12 thread CPU. It's based on uh, AMD's latest Zen architecture. The IPC is very good. The clock speed is very good. And it's more threads than you're gonna need in any current title as of now. So the six cores, 12 threads is going to give you a lot of future compatibility when it comes to games. And the 5600X is a pretty awesome overclocker if you wanna start playing around with overclocking. However, the board that we chose to pair it with is a Gigabyte B550M DS3H. It's a B550 chipset. We don't need any of the X570 stuff to increase our costs artificially with features that we aren't gonna need. Um, and by the way, I forgot to mention that 5600X, I also is in leaving the box cooler on there because as we showed you in the past, box coolers are still perfectly fine for any of the CPUs in this particular range before you start overclocking. So like I said, the B550M DS3H, it's got dual M.2 slots on there. It's got plenty of SATA 6 gigabit per second ports on there. Obviously it's got P PCIe Gen 4. So if you want to update later to M.2 and stuff, you're going to get the PCIe Gen 4 speeds. Uh, it's in micro ATX motherboard, which is that kind of a weird, funky, sort of a forgotten form factor. But the nice thing about it being micro ATX is it means you could save some money with going with a smaller case if you wanted to. RAM, uh, pretty simple here. I went with Team Group T Create Classic 10L. The reason why I went with this is the fact that it's a 3200 megahertz CL22 RAM. So it's going to work with Ryzen, even though it's not specifically listing Ryzen compa compatibility. 
The frequency keeps the, the Infinity fabric uh, down around 1600 megahertz, which is well below its known limit of around 1900 megahertz. The CL22 is loose enough to where it shouldn't have any issues running on Ryzen. The nice thing is the 5600X uh, does not technically have an Infinity fabric. It has a single chiplet design because of the fact that it's not multiples of them. Therefore, it's gonna, it's actually gonna be really solid uh, and work with just about any memory. The RAM comes in at about 55 bucks. I forgot to mention pricing. So the AMD CPU that we talked about is $229. So the 5600X, it's core speed, it's core count, and it's capability at 229 is still completely unmatched in my opinion by anything Intel has to offer. And the board comes in at $109, which I find is about the lowest I'd be willing to go in terms of build quality and components with the CPU that we're pairing it with. Fortunately, pricing on power supplies is normalized again. Just a few years ago, power supplies were super expensive because of the capacitor shortage. I chose the Corsair CX650. The CX series is by far one of the most popular uh, budget power supplies that you can get. It is an 80 plus bronze. So that's what I was saying. Like I chose to save a little bit of money with an 80 plus bronze power supply, but one that's got 14,000 reviews on Amazon and it's got 4.5 stars out of five. Um, if you look though, with that many reviews, you are gonna find a, a serious amount of them that did have problems. So that's kind of true though for any power supply down in this price point at $59.99. So I've used CX series power supplies. We have a few of them here. I've personally never had a problem with them, but you're gonna have to go with what you feel comfortable based on the reviews also at your price point. So I stuck with the CX Series 650 because it also will give some future compatibility and upgrade room in terms of graphics cards. Now, would I pair a CX 650 watt 80 plus bronze Corsair power supply with say a 3080 Ti or 3090 or a 6900 X in the future? No, I wouldn't because one, it's underneath the recommended power limit or power consumption uh, or power delivery of the power supply, I should say. Um, but two, I don't like to run power supplies near their limit, uh, which means at 650 watt, we're anything above like a 3070 Ti or a 3080 or a 6800 or 6800 XT is gonna be like right at the limit for that power supply in terms of safety and reliability. But this is a thousand dollar build. So how much money are you really gonna spend on your power supply for future compatibility at the cost of reducing the components you can put in the system now to have a future proof power supply? That's kind of a dumb move. So that's why I went this particular route. All right, now storage. This is an area where you could quickly and easily blow your budget depending on the type of storage that you go with. So for obvious reasons, in this price point, I chose a SATA drive. SATA 3, six gigabit per second is still plenty fast. 540 megabytes per second read uh, is about where it caps out. I, I feel like we've really sort of done a disservice in terms of showing M.2s in all of our builds for so long. That's just because the price of M.2s truly have come down versus where they are. You can get a two terabyte drive now for 200, 250 bucks, where before that was gonna be a $1,200 drive. Um, but for $72, we get the Team Group AX2 one terabyte 3D NAND. So it's again, Still capped out at 540 megabytes, whether it's 3D NAND or not. But uh, Team Group has obviously spent a lot of time, I know this sounds like a Team Group ad, right? With the RAM and stuff, but it's not. It's just the way the pricing worked out. Um, if you look at the reviews again, there's like 5,000 reviews on this particular SSD. Tons of positives. Um, I don't know much about the controller uh, setup that's in here, but based on the user reviews, I'm willing to, I would be willing to take a chance on this on my own build. Um, and we can save a lot of money. If we want to get a one terabyte, NVMe, we'd be looking at starting around $115 or so, which is uh, what, about $40 more, $50 more than what we have here. So as you can see, the prices really start to stack up quickly. Now, here's the thing. You could also save money by going with a smaller drive if you wanted, if you have another drive that you could use as a secondary drive. The problem is with the size of the Windows partitions these days and the size of games, something like a 480 or a 500 gigabyte drive or 512 is just gonna fill up extremely fast. You're gonna find that you might be able to put one, maybe two games on there at the most, and you're gonna have very little storage left over. So if you want to put pictures, you want to put store videos or edit videos, you're not gonna even be able to import a lot of the videos, depending on how big your capture is, without having a second scratch drive or something else. So that's why I just say one terabyte with today's program sizing is the absolute minimum. Graphics card, and I'll talk about the case after that. Graphics card, I chose the EVGA uh, 1660 Super. It's still $464, which really sucks because that card is a generation old and that card should be around $290 or so, $280. So you can see pricing is still high. It's slowly coming down, but still high. But a 1660 Super is going to give you perfectly fine 1080p gaming. It's not gonna give you DLSS, it's not gonna give you ray tracing or any of that stuff. It's just gonna give you a good 1080p uh, with 
six gigabytes of GDDR6. So in terms of frame buffer, you have plenty of overhead when it comes to the six gigabytes at 1080p. Um, it's gonna have no trouble running 1080p, 120 hertz, 100 hertz, some games 140 hertz, no problem. The dual fan makes it silent. We just had really good success with this card. We actually have one, a couple of them here. Um, haven't had any issues with them in the past. I find they overclock extremely well when you get the EVGA version because of the fact that they have tons of cooling headroom uh, and they have a more unlocked power limit. So if you want to max out the power limit, give it a little bit of extra core clock, you, you have that available to you. But at $464, you can see that's nearly half of our entire budget. So that's why I was saying you start, you have a fixed budget, right? If you, if you push one graph down, another graph has room, but if you push that graph down, another one can come up. Well, if they're all up, they can't be, right? Because they're gonna have their limits based on where the, the caps are gonna be. So that's why that left me uh, going over budget, obviously the, about the price of the case, which is the Fractal Design Focus G. Now the Focus G has two intake fans, plenty of mesh. It's gonna fit an ATX board, which gives us future upgraded path if we want to, um, but it's $71. So I tried to stay at exactly $1,000 or below and it doesn't include tax. The problem with tax is it's different everywhere you are. Hey, look, if I apply for, a, if I apply for an American Express card, I save $125, bringing it down to $939. No, don't go into debt over this. Don't, don't no, say no to credit cards. Anyway, moving on, uh, the total here was $1,064.65. So almost the entire price of the case. If you have a case that you can reuse or found or bought, already then obviously the price of the case is moot here but you can see how saving ten dollars here or 15 there or 20 there could make up the price of this pretty easily i do find a 1064 dollar build to be still pretty much in that one thousand dollar price point the only problem here is this doesn't include an operating system it doesn't include a monitor keyboard mouse any of that stuff this is just the tower i've had a lot of people complain and sort of push back and say you should include the price of the tower and the motherboard or not the motherboard, but the monitor and the keyboard and mouse. Um, the thing is, there's just so many different routes there. Some people will choose just to use a TV in the meantime. Some people might already have just a super generic keyboard and mouse. Um, this is just, I mean, we talk towers here because the tower is the most expensive part of the setup. Now places you could obviously save a little bit of money here. You could step down the CPU slightly if you want, but I wouldn't recommend going down to a 3000 uh, Ryzen series only because of the IPC and clock speed improvement of the 5000 series Ryzen in my opinion makes the $229 worth it. The CPU will last a while and by a while I mean quite a few years. Six cores 12 threads on 5600X. It's at the end of its road when I say upgrade path because th this is the end of the AM4 socket. You guys already know the new socket from AMD coming out later this year is an LGA socket. It's AM5. It's not gonna be compatible with anything that's out today. So this is the end of the road for the Ryzen AM4 socket as we know it, which lasted from 2016 to 2022, six years of compatibility there. Can't complain about them bringing out a new socket. It was necessary for them to bring out the late, their newest architecture. The motherboard, not really anywhere to save money there. $109.99, there might be some that are 10, maybe $15 cheaper, but it comes all down to, again, user reviews and reliability. The Gigabyte DS3 series, has always been pretty reliable. Um, they're always more of an entry-level board. You're not, it's not gonna be super heavy. It's not gonna be tons of layers of PCB. It's not gonna have a, a lot of the frills and stuff that people are used to, but it's just a solid board that will boot and will work. As much as I don't like Gigabyte BIOS, they still make a solid motherboard, especially down at that price point. That makes it hard not to pair a $229 CPU with a $109 motherboard, making that combo cheaper than any Intel option, just for the CPU. So you can see why I went that route. The RAM, $55 for the RAM, for, eight, for 16 gigabytes of 3200 megahertz CL22 timing RAM. It's hard to go cheaper than that. I looked, I shopped, I might've saved five bucks, but then we were stepping the frequency down to 3000 and I wasn't really willing to go below 3200. 3200 has the, the, the best um, support in terms of AMD's reliability in terms of DOCP and such. Um, and if you stepped it up to 34 or 3,600, the price went up 15, 20, 25 bucks. So you can see now our thousand dollar build would easily be $1,100, which is 10% over budget. The power supply at $59. There were some cheaper options from EVGA down around 55. Um, didn't really find anything lower than that. The $5 difference between the EVGA and this didn't make up any sort of 
pricing here on this budget, so it wasn't make or break. The SSD though, at $72, you could go down to like a 500 gig if you wanted for around 50 bucks, but I'd much rather pay 25% more to have twice as much storage than to save 25 bucks and have half the storage. So that was a trade-off I was willing to make to beg, borrow, or steal an extra 20 bucks to make sure I could get a one terabyte SSD. The case, again, $71, it's a little expensive for a budget build like this. But the thing for me about a case is you have to make sure it has at least two case fans. So you can have one intake and one exhaust at the bare minimum. This case is set up with a dual intake or dual fans on the front, giving it all positive pressure. Um, but fortunately, these, these parts that we put in here are not very hot. So as long as you have at least an exhaust fan and an intake fan, any case will do. The 1660 Super is a very cool CPU in terms of its temperatures. Um, even though it's a dual axial fan, not gonna have a problem staying cool in even a basic box. I just chose a case that was ATX. That way, if we wanted to upgrade to a future platform, uh, or let's say you wanted to go, maybe you buy someone's 5900X that they're offloading because they're getting the newest Ryzen coming out next year. Um, you're gonna 99% of the time have to run an ATX board with that, which means that it will fit in this case. This case will not support eATX boards or anything beyond standard ATX, so that's something to keep in mind. Cases can be an area where you can quickly, as we've shown, run into compatibility problems because of just a few millimeters that doesn't fit here or there in the case. If you are not a fan of NVIDIA and 1660 Super is not your thing, that price point seems to be right around 6600s from uh, AMD cards. Not a 6600 XT, um, but 6600. Here's the weird thing though. The 1660 Super is at 460, or $464.99. We're actually cheaper than the 1600 non-Supers I was finding on average. So it's, re it's really odd, um, but you can find some 1660 Supers for $700, which is really stupid. And you can find some 6600 non-XTs for $700. So pricing is still just volatile and all over the place. Um, but this was a in-stock item, Prime, get it tomorrow. So that's why I chose it. But there are 6600 options out there at the same price point if you're an AMD fan. So that's the way I spec it. Um, maybe what I'll start doing in the future is kind of maybe do like Paul does. He, he'll buy these systems and he'll build them and show here's the performance and maybe here's where he would have made some changes and stuff. So that'd be, I'd be a complete biter of Paul if I did that. But uh, I feel like now that I'm, the amount of emails I'm getting from people asking for parts list, I can always tell when people are buying stuff and when the industry is starting to normalize in the sense that people are going from there, okay, I'm done waiting till I'm gonna buy by the amount of emails I get from people asking me to look over their parts list. And I've been getting a ton of those over the last few weeks, which tells me that people are slowly now starting to purchase once again. So not only are views starting to creep up again, so are the amount of people asking me for their, my advice on parts lists, which tells me that uh, spending money on PC parts is happening again. It's not that it ever stopped, it's just I think the average Joe now is starting to buy, whereas before it was everyone else that was just either with uh, you know disposable income, buying expensive parts or whatnot, now the average guy is out there trying to build their system because they're done waiting. Anyway guys, what would you change in this system? Uh, I'll put the full list of parts down below and then you guys can tell me how you would spend a thousand bucks. So thanks for watching as always, we'll see you in the next one.